Good morning, everybody. So great to see you all, and welcome. I'm so excited to bring everyone together. And as Vicki said, um, I became CEO in 2020, and uh, really the first thing that I, this, an event just like this was one of the first things on my list of what I really wanted to do. When I thought about where I want Valley Vision to be, I thought, you know, we're the regional convener. I want us to be bringing people together around the issues that really matter and helping build community and bridges across people and issues as we do that. And um, it's taken a couple years to make this happen. Uh, and a few things have happened in the meantime. It's been a bit of a roller coaster, but that part of the vision has never changed for me. And I've always been really um, wishing and thinking about how we want to pull everybody together in just exactly this way. So today is a culmination of a lot of thought for me and a lot of excitement um, to be able to see our whole region here in this room. Right off the bat, I want to thank our elected officials who are here, and we're very lucky to have diverse representation from across our entire six-county region, and I thank them on behalf of both me and SACOG. And um, I also want to recognize our federal congressional representative who's here, Congressman Ami Berra. Congressman Barra is a longtime champion of bold and aligned regional action, and I want to give him, a, give him the floor for a couple minutes. I think Evan wanted me to dance and rap up here first. <laughs> it's election season. That's how you lose um, elections. You know, um, thank you for giving me a, a moment. Um, you know, the Livability Summit really, for those of us that have been around for a couple decades, here is really an extension of the work that Valley Vision did a few decades ago around the blueprint, which was um, you know, groundbreaking, nationally acclaimed, bringing together communities and charrettes and so forth to really kind of lay out how we wanted to grow. And this was kind of as our region was coming out of its adolescence into young adulthood, thinking about how do we want to grow as a region. Um, a remarkable work, and I think uh, the work that you're doing, Evan, that your predecessor, Susan Frazier, did a couple decades ago is an extension of that. This is exactly the right time to be doing this because we have gone through you know, a turbulent decade. Going back to the financial crisis and the recession that impacted our region tremendously, coming out of that, starting to feel like we're about to hit the ground running and spread our wings and then running into the pandemic, running into the summer of 2020. Um, coming out of that, knowing that the world has changed, seeing the impact of climate change, of water insecurity, of you know, record heat during the summertime, I would say we shouldn't be thinking about how we go back to where we were five years ago, but we should imagine what the future that we're about to inhabit looks like. And this is a room full of leaders we all have a stake in this. And we, my challenge to all of you is we can't think about this as one particular city or one particular county. Um, we've got to think about ourselves as a region. We've got to understand the assets and attributes that we have as a region and build off of those, not compete with one another, but find a way to collaborate. And that's what Valley Vision does great, but we've got great organizations like SACOG, SMUD, others that are sponsors in this room that are all regional organizations. So my challenge is we've got to come together. It's not about one city or strong suburbs. It's about a strong region working together. And I think that's what will come out of the work that Valley Vision's leading, but the work that all of us are going to have to do. So I'm wildly optimistic about the future. We have headwinds. We've got challenges in the central city with homelessness. We've got affordability challenges and so forth. But these are solvable issues if we work together. So at the federal level, I look forward to working with our state leaders, with our county leaders, and with our local city leaders, and all of our leaders here. So thank you for that. And I'm not going to wrap. <laughs> thank you, Congressman. I thought maybe you'd dance just a little bit. but <laughs> All right. So. My job here this morning is to present the data of the livability poll to you. And before I do that, I want to dwell a little bit on this word livability. I loved what Vicki said about livability in her remarks, and then I loved seeing that word cloud up there 
where you all contributed kind of what you think of when you think of livability. And I saw so many things that, that we thought of too as we were thinking about livability in this event and the, and the poll that we're gonna share with you. And um, when we think about livability, we're thinking of uh, affordable housing, safe and inclusive neighborhoods, affordable uh, access to basic needs like healthy food, healthcare, transportation, green and open spaces to gather and play, access to jobs and education, and vibrant places where there's food and culture and arts. And we put this together, and this is a beautiful picture of community. I mean, this really shows what a livable community is. But I think it's also really important to acknowledge in this room that not all neighborhoods and communities have access to, these, to this level of, of amenities. And that's why this, this conversation is so important for us to really think together, how do we build these livable communities in our region, and how do we do it all together? I'm learning how to use my clicker here and how it relates to the screen in front of me. All right. <laughs> so another piece of, uh, of this event for us was the tagline. Your voice belongs, your voice makes change. And I want to talk a little bit about this word belong. I think that belonging is always a critical part of livability, but I think it's really important in this moment right now to be thinking about this idea of belonging. I've heard in my conversations I had before the event, Many people think, it's so nice to be back in person. It's so rare to be able to do that these days. And it's true. It has been hard for us to get together over the last couple of years. And I know we're tired of talking about pandemic trauma, but it's really real. People have been more isolated, more disconnected, lost time with friends and family, and even lost loved ones to the pandemic. And when we think about making change in our communities and doing good things together, I think that where we are right now is we really need to kind of start at this foundation of community building, get back in the practice of working together, being together, and helping cultivate this feeling of belonging. And so that was the spirit that we not only want to bring into our community, but we really wanted to bring into this event and really embody today um, and think about how do we build community person by person, experience by experience, in a way that enables us to work effectively and wholeheartedly together. So, to do this work, there must be a sense of belonging. And when we have that, we can make change, we can find common ground, and we can be bold and ambitious in our efforts. And I'd like to start today, like right now. So you all, as you came in, might notice that you're not necessarily sitting with the people that you came with, and there might be people at your table who you don't know. And we did this on purpose, because we wanted to play that role of creating bridges across people. So we want you to be able to hear new perspectives, meet new people, and hear new ideas that maybe you hadn't thought about. So we want to create this community building right there at your table. We have table hosts or table facilitators at each table to help bring you along and facilitate these conversations. So here in a minute, I'm going to ask you to do two things. I'm going to pause for my remarks. And first, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself to the people at your table, especially those whom you don't know. And second, I'm going to throw to you kind of the first question of the day. And we're going to do this a lot. We're going to be in dialogue with each other. We're going to need to be open-minded, hear different perspectives, listen to each other. And I, the, one, the question I'm throwing to you is, is a challenging one. It's going to be a little bit controversial. There might be some strongly held views. And you're only going to have like two minutes to talk with other people about it. So, <laughs> so we're just throwing you right in. And I'd like you to you know, really try to listen, try to practice uh, what we're talking about here. So here we go. Here's the two things. We're going to introduce yourself and then discuss. Is a hot dog a sandwich or a taco? So go ahead. This is you now for like two minutes. <laughs> All right, I'm going to call us back together. Okay, so who said it was a sandwich? Raise your hand. Anyone? Sandwich? A hot dog is a sandwich. Strongly held, held views here. D taco? Did anyone say a hot dog is a taco? There's an argument to be made. I see a couple maybes. 
All right, we wanted to throw you something controversial and thought-provoking, but completely inconsequential. So I hope you had a little bit of fun with that. And that's the spirit that we want to take. And I can tell that you're, that you're really into it. I heard the laughing and the talking and the difficulty in bringing you back here. So that's perfect. OK, so I'm going to get into the data now. Uh, so this is kind of the foundation of our event today. At Valley Vision, we believe in data-driven decision making. And what, we're, what we use to do this and what we're going to start with is the results of the livability poll. And I'm going to tell you about the particularities of the livability poll, but I'm also going to tell you right up front that the data that we got back from this poll was very disheartening. Um, it, was hard, it was hard for us to kind of absorb and analyze and read because it's, it's really talking about how are people doing on their day-to-day -day lives around some key quality of life issues. And there's a lot of hardship going on in our region right now and in, in our nation, frankly. And so I want to kind of prepare you for that. And um, you know, I also want to kind of think about this quote from James Baldwin. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And that's kind of the spirit that I'm looking at this data with, is saying it's, it's important for us to be able to really look at the conditions that are going on in our community, really absorb that, and really work it through with each other, and talk about it, and think about it, and think about how we can make changes. So the livability poll, um, the, our polling project, um, or our polling initiative in general, is a partnership with Sac State's Institute for Social Research and CAP Radio. We do two or three of these polls a year, always kind of looking at what are the pressing issues of our region right now. It's a six-county poll, so it includes Sacramento, Yolo, Yuba, Sutter, El Dorado, and Placer counties. And the livability poll had just under 2,000 respondents to it. It was in the field um, this summer, so from June to July. It's weighted demographically to represent the region, and, it, and this poll has a 2.3% margin of error. So what that really means is that we had a large enough sample size that uh, using a, a statistical formula, we, could, we can confidently say that the, that the responses of this sample really represent the, the region as a whole. So first, I'm going to talk about affordability in our region. And the cost of living in our region really is, a, is at the center of many of the hardships that our residents face. So the first thing that we're going to look at is affordability of necessities. So this is really looking at how, how are people able to afford their basic needs, as well as things that they need to kind of build more success in their life. And the blue bar that you're seeing represents those who said they cannot or can barely afford. And the green bar represents can comfortably afford. So if we look at something absolutely fundamental, like adequate food supply, we had 30%, that's almost a third of our respondents, say that they cannot or can barely afford, which is a really dire um, number for us. And it's pretty consistent with the poll that we did last year that looked at food system resilience, where we saw really high degrees of food insecurity. You can look down this list and see similarly that there's a lot of uh, really important basic necessities that people are having a hard time affording, including health care, bills, rent or mortgage, transportation, et cetera. I want to go all the way down to the bottom of this table and look at savings. We had 65% of people said that they cannot or can barely afford to put aside money to save. This is a really good indicator of financial health, is if you're, willing, if you're able to put some money aside to build your future on. And the, the majority of the people in our region are not able to do that, which is very concerning. We're not alone in this struggle. Um, it's not unique to our region. We're seeing significant increases in cost of living across the nation. So 9.1% in the last 12 month period. This is the largest increase in 40 years. And so and I know we all feel this when you think about the price of gas, food, other services. Um, we're seeing a lot of inflation happening right now, and it is creating a lot of hardship for people in our region, including as it relates to housing and homelessness. So uh, you're going to see soon that we, when we ask people what are, your, what are your biggest concerns for people in the region, housing and homelessness were number one and number two. And um, in fact, these, these are a big challenge for people when it comes to affordability. So when we asked, um, can, you afford, can you afford your rent or mortgage? We had 41% of respondents across the line who can barely or cannot afford their rent or mortgage. But when you break that up by race and ethnicity, the story is even worse. Uh, we see that 64% of black or African American 
respondents were cannot or can or can cannot afford or can barely afford rent or mortgage. And you can see down the line that our communities of color are disproportionately affected by affordability challenges in our region. So as I just mentioned, when we asked, what are your biggest concerns um, of, of, in the region about what's going on? Uh, homelessness and the cost of housing were number one and two. We also saw environmental threats and crime as major areas of concern for people. And very much intertwined with the cost of housing um, is homelessness. And from 2019 to 2022, there was a 67% increase in the number of individuals experiencing homelessness in Sacramento County. And when you break that down by race, we see that whites are underrepresented in that population, and those who are black or African American are overrepresented. So again, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of disparities by race and ethnicity. When asked about thoughts on potential solutions for this, a survey conducted by Sacramento State's Institute for Social Research said that residents say that we should prioritize providing services to unsheltered individuals versus clearing encampments. And the majority of residents said that they would, um, they would be in favor of a tax increase to help address homelessness issues. So a major issue that came through in our poll, not, not a big surprise to any of us, but, um, but certainly a really serious and dire um, issue here in our community. Next, I want to talk about mental and emotional health, which is also a really important component of livability. And what we saw in our survey, that communities are hurting. So 52% of residents reported feeling, feelings of depression and hopelessness in the last week. Uh, believe it or not, these numbers are a little bit improved from a year ago when we did our COVID-19 resilience survey. We saw that people were feeling even more depressed and, hope and hopeless. And then we saw 81% of people reported that they have felt stress or anxiety in the last week. And despite these levels of, of, of distress, almost a third of residents say they do not have access to quality and affordable mental health services. Again, this is not entirely unique to our region. A national study by the mental by Mental Health America in April 2022 reported increased instances of kind of all mental health concerns across the board, including depression, stress, anxiety, suicide ideation um, since 2019. So our, the mental and emotional health struggles that we continue to feel um, that, that were intensified by the pandemic continue to linger on. Okay, that was a lot of the really bad news. So that was, <laughs> I know that was a lot. That was hard to hear. It's not necessarily new information for us, but having it all kind of come at you with numbers one right after the other is, um, is hard to hear. Um, so we're gonna turn a corner a little bit and we're gonna talk about opportunity in our region and um, the way that our people are kind of shaping how they wanna be thinking about education and work. So the landscape of work and opportunity has changed dramatically in the last few years. Um, and this was maybe intensified or accelerated by the pandemic, but there, these were actually trends that were already going on, including automation, reliance on digital technologies, and changes in the demographics of our workplace, or of our workforce. And lately, we've been hearing kind of these buzzwords going around, like the great resignation or quiet quitting and I don't think these buzzwords tell the whole story, but they do kind of show us this indication that our workforce is looking for uh, a different type of culture when it comes to jobs and work. And um, there's been an, increase, an increased focus on how do we kind of create this healthy balance between life and work, and how do we create a work environment that works for all people. When we, in our livability poll, when we asked about reasons for job dissatisfaction, um, we found that the most cited reasons were low wages, not enough opportunities for promotion, and poor workplace culture. So our, our poll kind of bore that out, that there's, there's dissatisfactions coming up with people's work environments. When we asked what they wanted to see, 96% of residents whose jobs could be done remotely want to be able to work from home at least one day a week. And for me, whenever I see 96% in a survey, that's an incredibly strong finding. We can really say that universally, people are looking for flexibility in their work environment um, when, when they're able. 
So I think that's a really important thing to think about um, for our employers in the room. 73% of residents are interested in, a, in additional education and job training opportunities, particularly if these opportunities are short-term, remote or hybrid, and have flexible or weekend hours. So this is a full three-fourths of our, of our residents, regardless of job status, are looking for new education and training opportunities. And I think one thing that's really important about this is what they indicated they're looking for doesn't necessarily look exactly like what we might think of when we think of education and job training. You know, it's really these short-term, online availability, flexible hours type opportunities. So I think that's something really important for those of us in the room to think about. Those in our youngest generation are actually feeling more optimistic about their employability than they were a year ago. So when we look at their job prospects, um, they're more likely to think that they are increasingly employable due to changes in the industry, the availability of jobs, and especially their own skill set. So we're seeing a lot of optimism here. People are feeling like they're a good fit for the jobs that are available. This is in contrast to the poll that we fielded in March when we learned that those in the younger generation were the most pessimistic when they were thinking about their, um, their employability. Okay, I started with an emphasis on belonging and I wanna come back to that to, to finish this. So, this idea of belonging as a really important component of livability is something that we explored as we were thinking about and planning this event. And we did a few focus groups thinking about what does livability mean to you. And one of our foundational questions for these focus groups is, think about the neighborhood you grew up in. What did you love about that neighborhood? What made it special to you? And the, the stories that we kept hearing time and time again were really about feelings of belonging in their neighborhood. It was, I felt like people were looking out for me. I was able to travel around by bike and feel safe about that. And it was, it was about both family but neighborhood as well. Regardless of the amenities that were available in a neighborhood, that feeling of belonging made a huge difference in people's experiences growing up. So we wanted to start there with how do people feel in the neighborhood that they live in. And we found that the majority of our respondents feel accepted by neighbors, supported by neighbors in times of need, and connected to neighbors. And you can kind of see that in the yellow line across the board. Those are, on average, relatively high numbers, especially with 83% feeling accepted by neighbors. You also see an age effect in this, and that's what this chart is depicting, that if the older you are, the more, um, the more you feel accepted, supported, and connected in your neighborhood. To me, this kind of speaks to the, uh, kind of the, the way life goes and that you end up living someplace longer and getting more invested as you get older there, but it's, it's, it's very important that people of all ages are feeling connected in their neighborhood. So, um, that's what we learned here. We also wanted to find out more about the formal ways that people might engage in their communities. So we asked about things like community service, um, going to school, arts, or sports events, going to community meetings, charity fundraisers, local political events, and just getting together with people to collaborate to solve a problem. We found that 40% of people reported that they had done community service in the last five years. <coughs> And there was a, a, a quite a bit of participation across the other categories as well. For 28% of our respondents, they had, not re, they had not participated in any of these over the last five years. And when we asked why not, it was, it was usually cited that they either weren't aware of these activities that were going on, or they didn't feel like their voice mattered, or they didn't feel welcome in that space. So I think that's a really important call to action for all of us here. We're all in a community event right now. And it it's might be safe to say that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're all tuned in to the events that are going on in our community. It's definitely worthwhile to make that effort to make sure people are aware of those events. And then when you're there, to make sure everyone in the room feels welcome and has a, and has a voice that can be heard. All right, so that's, the, that's kind of the statistics that I'm gonna share with you, but I wanna acknowledge there's a lot of other pressing issues affecting our communities right now. Um, and there's more data in the report. So the full report is now available online. I'm gonna show you the link in a minute, but, um, but you, can see, you can see what people had to say about some of these other issues. But issues like climate change and sustainability, so important to our communities right now, and we're right in the heart of wildfire season right now in ways that has, and that has, has impacted so many of our communities in our region. 
Broadband access and digital equity, these issues were laid bare by the pandemic and continue to present barriers to opportunity for people. Um, ongoing uh, COVID-19 and other public health concerns continue to be of, of great um, concern for communities. And that's just to name a few. Um, there's, there is um, a number of different things that, that impact livability. And when I look out in the room, I really see so many of you who are the people who are working on these issues on a regular basis. So when you think about workforce and education, environmental justice and climate adaptation and sustainability, public health, and so many other things that, that represent the type of work that you all are doing. Um, so I'm very, despite the fact that we've looked at some kind of dire numbers, the fact that we're all here thinking about this, talking about this with so many of the people who are, that are doing the work is very, um, that makes me feel very hopeful and optimistic. So you can view the full report online. And one of my favorite parts about the report is that we did nine spotlights on community-inspired solutions. So we highlighted nine different organizations that are doing work out in the community that addresses the issues that I've just talked to you about. And I think that's a, it's always really important to stay grounded in how are we creating solutions? Who's doing this work? How do we support those people? All right, so I hope that as we go through this data that you're finding things that you are leaning into that might inspire you to think about something differently or to, or to address and take action around. Um, I think that, like I said, we know that there's, there's a lot of disheartening data here, but that that is present right now doesn't have to be our future. And we can start those conversations today, really, in thinking about what are the communities that we want to create and how do we do that together. So we are really going to start on this right now. So if you look on your agenda, every time it says community table, that means that you're going to have some time to talk about these issues there at your table. I would encourage you to move on from the hot dog taco sandwich conversation um, and I'm going to give you some questions to dive into about the data that, that I've just given. But first, I want to talk about creating that sense of belonging and inclusion right here at our tables and suggest some community agreements for all of us as we have these conversations. So I'd ask everyone, please assume good intentions of the people that are, your, that are at your table. They're here to explore solutions and share perspectives the same as you. Own your own impact, so be accountable to the way that you're impacting the other people at your table. Be, a, be an open-minded listener and have a learner mindset. Try to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. If we all just stayed in our comfort zone all the time, nothing new would ever happen, so we have to kind of shake it up sometimes. Um, and then know that we're all coming in here with our unique experiences, and that's what's really informing our, our view and our lens on how we're looking at things, so be respectful of other people's experiences. And so with that, we're going to go to the community table, and here in just a minute, I'm going to um, pull up the questions for you all. I'll first ask our table facilitators to wave, wave your hands. Yay, and I'll thank you so much. So we have, we have community volunteers, Valley Vision staff, SACOG staff, and others um, out here at the tables really helping to bring these conversations along. And for the next 20 minutes or so, um, here's what I'd like you to think about. So what comes up for you after hearing the livability poll findings? So what surprised you or what didn't surprise you or kind of what, what kind of thoughts did it, did it bring up for you? In your experience, what has helped your community grapple with these tough conditions? So where have you seen evidence of resilience and solutions being advanced? And where do you see ongoing challenges? So where do you see problems that we still need to dive into deeper? So with that, I'll turn it to you all, and we'll be back on the stage in about 20 minutes. Thanks, everybody.